In John chapter 2, you have this story of Jesus turning uh, water into wine, and he, he shows up at a wedding banquet. And it's just this uh, powerful story about how Jesus transforms things. And I, I want to read the whole, the whole narrative because I think uh, you might see a bigger picture. So hopefully you're looking at John chapter 2 with me. And uh, we're going to read verse 1 through 13 together. Here's what it says. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, what do you involve, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants had, who had drawn it, the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. When Jesus did what, when, what Jesus did here in Cana and Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and the disciples believed him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and the disciples. They stayed there for a few days. So there's this story that, that we're looking at. And I, I, I'm wanting you guys to see first that at the end of that story, John writes that this was the first of the signs that Jesus performed and many of the disciples believed. So like the first half of John is, is considered by some to be the book of signs because Jesus will perform many different signs in order to reveal his glory right? Kind of going back to John chapter 1, verse 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us, and then He says, we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only. And every time He reveals through a sign, it reveals a piece of His glory. But oftentimes when we see this story, we forget that there might be a main point. Like when I started looking at themes, what is, what is this, this text, what is this story going to tell us about Jesus? I thought maybe the first theme might be that Jesus cares for the little things, right? That's a, that's a big part of what's going on here. Here's this like tiny town of Cana in Galilee and Jesus shows up and he could be concerned about the big problems in the world, but he's also concerned about this little problem or seemingly little problem of this family running out of wine, right? And it, it kind of shows us that maybe Jesus cares about the little things. And so if he cares about the little things in this town, then he might also care about the little things that are happening in your life today as well, right? Those tiny frustrations like, man, I woke up this morning and there's so much snow and I have to shovel. He, like Jesus cares about those things. And that's kind of part of what this, uh, this story might be pointing to. Jesus cares about the little things. But I think that's a secondary issue. It's not the main point. Another point that we might pull out of this, if I was talking to my kids, would be like, don't ever talk to your mom like that. Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? Right? I guarantee you if Isaiah tried that, or even if I tried it with my mom, I would get smacked. Right? And so, so a lot of people have taken this, this story to talk about, well, how are parents and children supposed to interact with each other? And I think that's also a secondary point. It's not the main point of the text, although we can pull it from the text. It's not the main point. And in fact, if you go to that culture and understand how they communicated at that time, this wouldn't have been all that bad in the first place. It's the English translation and uh, our, our Western ears that make this, what Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? It makes it sound harsh, even though Jesus wasn't being harsh with his mother. So that might be another secondary issue, but it's not the point of the sign, right? John writes, this was the first of the sign that revealed the glory of Jesus and then, his, and then the disciples believed. So that again is a secondary topic, but not the point of the sign. Um, another secondary issue, right, might be like alcohol. And does, does God want us to drink or not? And, and if you want to have beer with dinner, you might point out that Jesus turned water to wine and therefore he must think it's okay, right? And maybe that becomes the big point of, of the narrative or the story of Jesus turning water to wine is that Jesus is here sanctifying wine at dinner, 
That's, that's what the point is, right? But that, again, is a secondary issue. It's not the main point of the, the topic. Jesus would have, have been somebody who uh, drank. He was called a wine bib by some. And so he's not, he's not, this story is not talking about the morality of drinking, right? That's not the point. It's not the reason for the sign. And so I was looking through all these, I think, secondary issues, and none of them seemed to fit the criteria of that verse that says, this was the first of the signs which demonstrated the glory of Jesus and through that all the disciples believed, right? Like those secondary issues weren't hitting the main topic. They were there and I could pull from them, but that's not the point. And so I, I, as I went through this study this week, I, I began to just ask, what was the point? Why did Jesus choose this event to, to enact this miracle? And what does it show us about the bigger picture of who he is and how does it reveal the glory of God, the one that dwelled among us. And so as I, as I went through it, I saw three things that really popped out that I think really point to the main purpose of this sign. And uh, are you guys ready for them? Again, I don't know. I I picked a a couple different orders, but we're going to see if we can stick to which order I picked last when I was looking at it earlier this afternoon. My first point is that uh, the sign shows that the Messiah has arrived at the wedding banquet. That's my first point. The Messiah has arrived at the wedding banquet. And I, I, I may have said earlier that, that uh, it seems like a small party in a small town, but wedding banquets in this time were not small parties. Like this whole month has been, well, a season of, of good news and great joy and even better parties, right? Like that we, that's, that's what it seems like this month has been about, party after party after party. And I like these Christmas parties because I get to wear my green sweater with the Jesus on it. And he says, you know, go Jesus, it's your birthday. Usually everybody starts talking about that sweater and it starts a couple conversations. I like it. I like the different parties. Who's gone to parties this month, right? I, I don't, two hands went up with Craig. He's, he's been to more than enough. Um, parties are fun. And if you've planned a party, you know how, how hard it can be. Like, you got to make sure there is enough food. And so usually you over plan and then there's too much food, right? But we spent a good week preparing for a party. And, and still we felt like that was a long time to prepare. And we had lots of time to shop. So those are parties today. But the kind of wedding banquet that, that Jesus was at is not like the parties that we plan today. See, in, in the culture Jesus is from, wedding banquets were planned years in advance, you knew that your child was going to be married and you knew when they were going to be married. And so it was a, a whole celebration that was prepared for, like, as you watched your child grow, you started to plan, like, this is my son or my daughter and they're going to grow up and who is going to be their bride or their groom? And you started to plan these things. And then you started to plan the whole event where they're going to leave your house and go on to, your, to their, their spouse's house. Like, this was a big deal. Not like the small parties we plan Nowadays, this was a big deal. And in a place like Cana, the whole village would have shown up to this party, right? And the anticipation for this party would have been long lasting. Like, hey, you know, next year you're getting married and that's going to be a party, right? And so can you imagine the, the amount of planning and the anticipation for this wedding banquet to only show up and find out there's not enough wine? Like that's not a small problem. That's humiliating for the family, right? These wedding banquets weren't just one day events either. Like if you go back and remember the story of Samson, the, his wedding banquet took a week. And, and he gave the, the Philistines a, a week to solve his riddle. And that week was the length of his uh, wedding banquet. These were big parties, right? And for that reason, these parties began to be symbolic of what it's going to be like when the Messiah comes. And, and the people would like use this as an analogy for what, what, when the Messiah comes, it's going to be like, like a great banquet. When the Messiah comes, it's going to be this beautiful party, right? And now Jesus has shown up to the party and no one knows that the Messiah is there. See, that's my first point. The Messiah has come to the banquet and, and they don't recognize him, right? And not only do they not recognize him, there's also not enough wine right? Because what, what is left, what he comes to is a world that, that he created, 
which doesn't recognize him. And so let's just look at a, a couple verses that, that point out this. It says, on the third day, which is interesting language. Um, John might be going chronologically and just leading us through, or he could be using the word day symbolically. And this day is the third day, which is the day Jesus read, raised from the dead. But he says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. Another thing that's interesting is John never gives Mary the name Mary. Always in the book of John, it's just Jesus' mother. So thank God for the synoptic gospels or she would be Jesus' mother who never had a name. But it says Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. See, the, the Messiah has come to the banquet and they weren't prepared for him, right? Jesus calls himself a bridegroom in Mark chapter uh, 2, verse 19. Here's what it says. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. See, Jesus understood that he's the bridegroom, and that he's come, and now that he's come, it's a time to feast and not fast, right? This, this sign taking place at the wedding banquet is showing us that Jesus has come. He's the Messiah at the wedding banquet, right? There's, it's also pointing forward. The, the book of Revelation in chapter 19 will talk about the wedding supper of the Lamb. And it says, blessed are those who do not miss out on the wedding banquet of the Lamb. It's a, it's a beautiful testimony to who Jesus is and what he's come to do. He's at the banquet. And, and the problem that they're running into at this banquet, at least, is they don't recognize him. See, I think that might be the problem that a lot of people are going through today. Jesus is here. He's the guest at the banquet and either you're not prepared or you don't recognize his coming, right? So Jesus tells us a parable and he says, the kingdom of God is like 10 virgins. And, and some of these virgins, they came prepared. They had lamps and they had jars of oil. There were, there were the, the wise ones. And then the other virgins, they just brought lamps. These he called foolish ones, right? Now, what these, what these virgins were supposed to do in this culture was they were supposed to, like, they were supposed to lead the parade for the bride and groom to get to, to the wedding banquet. And so you, they would leave from the, the bride's house and, and they, would, they would have this parade that takes the, the spouse, um, the bride from her house to her husband's house. And these virgins would have lamps that just lit the way. And there were some that just weren't prepared. And so when, when the bridegroom comes, they weren't ready for it, but he left anyway. And, and then they, they asked and they begged, can we have some oil? And they said, no. They, they knocked on the door and, and the, the bridegroom says, I didn't know you. I don't know you. See, the, the parable itself is a reminder to us that we have to be prepared for the Messiah to come to the banquet. That we have to make sure we're ready. Because when the Messiah came to Israel, that which was his own, his own did not receive him. It's an encouragement to us to be ready to receive him. So that's the, the first point that, that I get to whenever I'm looking at this, is that the Messiah has come to the banquet, right? My second point is uh, the sign, it, sh it shows the transformation that Jesus can do within our life, right? So, so they have a problem. Do you recognize that? They don't have wine. And this is not just a small problem for the people. This is a very large problem because you've known about this, this bride and this wedding banquet for years. You've had lots of time to prepare for it. You anticipated it's coming and yet you didn't bring enough. So in in John chapter two, Jesus says, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come, right? They don't have wine. His mother says, Jesus, you gotta do something. And he says, my hour has not yet come. All, all the times he uses that language, also in the book of John, it's pointing to his, his death, right? Like on the night that he, he is uh, washing the disciples' feet, he, Jesus knew that his hour had, was there. And so he put a towel around his waist to wash the feet. And so that's interesting language inside this this story as well. But Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, but his mother gives us the best wisdom that I think disciples can ever have. It says, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you, right? Like 
There's a great part of this story you could just circle and underline. Just do whatever Jesus tells you. See, people have been looking for wisdom throughout all of history, right? They stared at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they wanted to know, right? The book of Proverbs is, is set up almost like two people staring at that same tree. How do I be foolish and how do I be wise? Like, what do I, how do I live my life? People have, have gone throughout history looking for wisdom, and Mary puts it in the most simple terms that we can find in all of Scripture. Just do what Jesus tells you. Just do whatever he tells you to do. That's true wisdom. And, and kind of like this idea on how we're supposed to live our life, and, but I also just love that his mother overlooks what he said. You know, this isn't my hour. And she just says, just do whatever he tells you to do, right? So, so here's what Jesus tells him to do. It says, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial, ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it came from, though the servants had, who had drawn the water knew. Then they call, he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, but the cheaper wine after. The guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best for last. Like Jesus does something. He transforms this water, this common water, and he transforms it into wine. See, what is water used for? Well, if you work a hard day, you want water to just kind of keep you hydrated, right? Nobody goes to a party and drinks water, right? No, we, we go, well, Kathy does, okay. Maybe I got to remember my audience. Um, we, we, most people who want to want to celebrate, well, they want the wine. Jesus takes that ordinary water and he transforms it into wine. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing that this sign is pointing us to is what Jesus can do with a few stone jars and filled to the brim with water. And I, I want you to notice that like, as we think about these stone jars, why were they there in the first place? John tells us, he says, these were the ones used for ceremonial washing. So you've got these six stone jars that have dirty water. Why? Because everybody's going in there and washing their hands in them. Like this isn't just normal water. This is disgusting, right? And they fill up these jars. Even if they emptied them first, they're still dirty jars. And they fill them up with water and that becomes the best wine. It's, it's just this, this beautiful story of showing us how, how Jesus can, can take what is dirty and awful and he can make it new, Right? And, and he does that in, in our lives. And that's what this, this sign is pointing us to, the, the kind of transformation that can go from who you were to where God wants you to be, right? The, the book of Revelation is about God making things new. That's the, the idea that we're, we're pointing forward to is that one day there will be a new heaven, new earth, right? Behold, I make it. Let's, let's read it. In Revelation chapter uh, 19, it, it talks about, well, making things new. And it's just a beautiful picture of what Jesus has come to do. In Revelation 19, verse 9, actually, I'm going to read uh, Revelation 21, 1 through 5. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there were no longer any sea. I saw the holy city and a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven for from God prepared as a beautiful as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, "Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people." And then he dwelt with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Just think about that. I am making everything new. And that's what Jesus coming to this, this wedding banquet is pointing us to. The sign that says is supposed to reveal his glory is pointing to the fact that he is making and transforming and making everything new. These old stinky jars, which by the way, filled to the brim would have made 120 gallons an estimate, right? About 120 gallons worth of wine. 
So not only does he want to make you new, but it's a, it's a symbol of abundance, overabundance. I, would, I don't know how long I would make it at a party with 120 gallons of wine. Jesus makes all things new, right? And, and this, this miracle that he performs, this first miracle, is showing us that he is the Messiah at the banquet and he's come to make things new. My third point is that the sign is, is showing us that he's come to get rid of the old. Now, I'm not sure if that's how I put it. I said the sign reveals that Jesus replaces the old with the new. He, he replaces the old with the new. The best statement, I mean, Mary's statement is probably right up there, just do whatever Jesus says. But I think it's the, the, um, the head servant, right? The one who's in charge of everything. I think it's what he says, which really opens up the point of the sign. He says, some people will save the best, or, you know, here's what he says in uh, John chapter 2, verse 10. He said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. Like, I think that's the, the main statement that tells us what the sign is really about. You've saved the best till now. And, and here's why. Like, these old jars represented an old system of things. It's about how you, you cleaned yourself off. It's about, it's about ceremonial washing, right? And if, if the old thing represented the old covenant, then it's, it's, no, it's bitter compared to the wine that Jesus has come to bring. It's, it's, it's nowhere in comparison to the wine that Jesus has, which is the blood of the new covenant, right? And each week we come to the Lord's table and we look at that juice, remembering that this is representative of a new covenant, new wine, something that's much better than the old covenant ever could be, right? See, these jars were about tradition. These jars were about the law. They were a shadow pointing to the reality of Christ, but they were still the old thing. And Jesus has come to get rid of the old thing and come to bring something new. Mark kind of opens up what's going on with these jars because um, we forget, I think, in, in Mark when he talks about the jars. Um, he explains why the Jewish people would wash their hands. And so in, in Mark chapter uh, 7, verse 1 through 7, it says, The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come to Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they, they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash and observe, other, or observe many other traditions, such as washing cups, uh, pitchers, and kettles. I got to say, when I first read this, when I, was, I, I, I became a Christian kind of later, you know, early 20s or something. When I first read this, I'm like, the Pharisees are right, man. Like, you should be washing this stuff, right? That's disgusting. Jesus didn't wash you. Shouldn't you wash your, your cups and your dishes before you eat on them? That's kind of what I was like when I first came. I didn't quite understand this. I didn't understand that the Pharisees that, that were in this story would have had no understanding of germs or bacteria. The reason they washed their hands was a traditional thing. They did it because their fathers did it, and their fathers did it before them, and their fathers did it. Their hope was in this old tradition that didn't offer any hope at all, right? But Jesus comes to bring new wine, and so he replies. This is Jesus' reply in verse 6. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching is merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to traditions. The, the clay pots represented traditions. The new wine represents the new thing. It would make common sense to serve the, the better wine first. That way when everybody gets a little bit buzzed, they, they, they're not paying attention to what they're drinking, right? But Jesus comes and brings something so much better than Israel had to offer. That's why you guys are going through Hebrews on, on Wednesday night, the book of better things, right? The idea that the new covenant is new wine and it surpasses anything that came before it. And so when they see this miracle, and, and I keep calling it a miracle. John doesn't talk about miracles in his book. He calls them signs. 
And, and maybe I'm just like making a, a big distinction over just a phrase, but miracles, like they, they get us to go, ooh, or ah, like, wow, right? But signs point us to something. Like that's the difference. Signs, signs aren't there just to make us go, ooh, and ah. Signs are there to point to a bigger reality. So Jesus chose this sign, right? In fact, in John chapter 2, Here's what it says, verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana and Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed the glory and his disciples believed him. Like this sign was to point to Jesus' glory. It wasn't to point simply to the fact that Jesus cares about small things. He does, but that wasn't the reason for the sign. It doesn't point to the, the, the truth that you can have wine at dinner without feeling convicted about it. It, it, there, but that's not the point of the sign. The sign was to show us something about Jesus. And here's what it showed us. Jesus is the Messiah at the banquet. He's come to transform things and to get rid of the old and bring us new wine, which is far better than whatever old wine you were drinking. The question is, like the disciples, can you believe that and accept it? This new, new year, as we think about new things, Maybe that's the direction we have to go is what old wine are we continuing to drink and put our hope in? And how can we begin to, to go after that new wine that's available to us because Jesus is at the banquet?